Hello everyone and welcome to a video where I will be sharing with you some of the most important information regarding the FIDE Candidates Tournament 2024 uh, that starts in some five and a half hours uh, uh, from the moment uh, where I'm recording this video. And uh, yeah, uh, let's uh, dive straight into it. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the time format, the prizes, the players, the venue, uh, pretty much everything you guys uh, wanted to know in the previous video and a lot of the, a lot of the things that you guys haven't even mentioned as uh, I've, uh, I, I've uncovered some very, very interesting uh, things about the candidates tournament. So this, uh, this year it's taking place in, uh, in Toronto, in, in Canada, which is I'm um, pretty sure great for a lot of you who are from the United States, but uh, from us who are from Europe, uh, it it will be uh, fairly time consuming as the the runs will start at 8:30 uh, p.m. and they might uh, end you know maybe in two 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 or maybe 3 a.m. or maybe you know who who knows uh, so it, it will be uh, uh, fairly difficult to to cover but I will do my best I will do my best to cover at least one round per day and then maybe. Uh, if if we, if we will have more than one interesting game, uh, some of the um, uh, games for the for the other day. Uh, so uh, to, to get uh, that out there, and also these are the players. So let's see who is playing in this year's candidates tournament. And also this will be the first time that the women's and the men's candidates tournament is taking uh, place in the same time in the same place. Uh, in the in the Great Hall in Toronto, in Canada. So uh, Hikaru Nakamura, uh, the, uh, there we have Anna Muzichuk, um, uh, Hampi Koneru, Nijat Abasov, Fabiana Corwana, Pragnananda, uh, Alexander Goryachkin, Anurgil Salimova, Tanjongi, Gukesh, um, uh, Vaishali, uh, there's Yanni Pomnishi, Vidit, uh, Alireza Firuja, Katrina Lachno, and uh, uh, Leiting J. And uh, uh, for, uh, also, one very important thing uh, is uh, 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 these are the pairings for the first round. So let's uh, check them out. There you have it. Fabiano Corwana will face Hikaru Nakamura. Uh, Nijat Abaso will face Yanni Pomnish. Alreza Firuja will face Pragnananda. Gukesh will face Vidit. Uh, Goryachkina will face Katarina Lachno. Anna Muzichuk will face Nurgil Salimova. Leiting J will face Tanjongi. And Vaishali will face Hampi Koneru. Now, what you can uh, see from this is that uh, it's, it's only the first round, but they are already uh, matched the... Uh, sort of uh, by federation. Fabiano and Hikaru are both representing the United States. Gukesh and Vidit are both representing India. Uh, Goryachkina and Lachno are both representing Russia. Uh, 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 Leiting J and Tanjongi are both representing China. And Vaishali and Hampi are both representing India. So this is uh, made by design. Uh, it was not a uh, a random uh, pairing, uh, as uh, as explained by the chief arbiter, it is uh, meant to eliminate any possible scenario where you will have the final round of the FIDE candidates tournament. And let's say uh, Hikaru is leading by a full point. I'm just you know saying Hikaru. There's uh, no no insinuations there. Uh, and that let's say Hikaru is leading by a full point and he's facing Fabiano Caruana. And now let's say uh, if uh, Hikaru were to win. Uh, then he wins the candidates tournament. So they want to eliminate the possibility of two players from this uh, representing the same federation meeting up uh, in an important round. So by pairing them in the first round, uh, that uh, you know it, it, it's not impossible for such a scenario to occur, but it is much much less likely to occur, and especially it will not occur in the final round. Uh, you know, if, if it will happen in the middle of the tournament and the players still do that, then that, I mean, that's just weird. Uh, but just uh, to share that with you. And also, uh, this is the, sorry, uh, this is the venue. This is the Great Hall uh, where the tournament will be taking place. And uh, this is what it looks like inside uh, where the players will be playing. So these are the chairs they will be using. This is the... Uh, the playing venue, uh, there, there have it. Uh, probably some, some of the microphones. They will have cameras there. It will be, uh, look, of course, much different when the players will are actually seated. But just uh, get a general idea, which is much, much different than the previous uh, venue for the 2022 candidates tournament that looked like this. Now, okay, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a big difference, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe it will be easier to, to concentrate here. On the other hand, some of you might prefer this. So you know. Uh, it's a it's a give or take, and also uh, here is a very nice photo of Jan Gustafsson and Peter Svidler. Now, for those of you who are wondering why am I showing a random photo of Jan Gustafsson and Peter Svidler, well, they are uh, uh, serving as seconds in the in this FIDE candidates tournament. Jan Gustafsson will be seconding none other than Jan Nepomniši, which is uh, very funny, as Jan was of course Magnus' second in his World Chess Championship match against. Um, uh, Yanni Pomnishi, and now he will be uh, helping Jan uh, to 
challenging for the title and Peter Svidler is serving as uh, the second for Young Pregnananda. And uh, we, do, we know some of the seconds for other players, for example, Caruana seconds will be uh, Cyrilla uh, and Oparin. Uh, for Nakamura, I, I don't think it's known and I'm taking this um, uh, from Giri's tweet, Anish Giri tweeted this, he says Nakamura's little John uh, could be Jeffrey Xiong, uh, Nepo will be uh, seconded by Jan Gustafsson, Alireza Firuzja unknown, says perhaps his father, uh, uh, Pragnananda will be uh, seconded by Master Svidler, Gukesh will be seconded by Gajewski and perhaps his father, Vidit by uh, uh, Surya Shekhar Ganguli and Daniel Vokaturo, and uh, Nijat Abasov, um, uh, Azerbaijan's uh, sixth uh, player by, by rating, will be seconded by the first player by ratings, uh, none other than Shahriar Mamedyarov. Uh, so uh, some extra info about uh, about the seconds who will be seconding the players. And also uh, let's check out a little bit of info about the actual candidates tournament. Uh, so there we have it. Uh, let me just uh, make this a little bit. Sorry, so you can see. Okay, there that should do it. So uh, chess history in the making. This is from the FIDE uh, uh, from the official FIDE website. Candidates tournament is the chess in chess is the second only to the match for the title of the world champion. It is the final stepping stone in an inevitable path every chess player has to cross if they want to get a chance for the world crown to be bestowed on their head. So I'm pretty sure most of you know this, but I'm pretty sure also at least some of you don't. Now, uh, a new chapter in chess history will be written in Toronto, Canada, as some of the strongest world players gather to decide amongst themselves who will be the next challenger for the title of world champion. So uh, the tournament will be held from April 2nd to April 23rd. Uh, I think April 22nd is the, f is the last day. April 23rd will be uh, the, uh, well, the... the uh, the, the prizes will be will be dealt and also maybe if tie breaks will be needed then uh, also tie breaks will be decided on the, on the 23rd uh, so uh, something else we could maybe uh, consider the total prize fund for the event is 750,000 euros that's 820,000 uh, dollars 500,000 euros going for the open section and 250,000 euros going for the uh, women's candidates tournament uh, all right, uh, there we have it. There we have it. Uh, let's also check out the schedule. This is the schedule. Uh, I will put all the links in the description below so you guys have access to them. Uh, but yeah, uh, yesterday was the media day. Uh, if you if you're on Twitter or you know if you want to check out the FIDE's website, you will have all of the nice photos where the the players were. Uh, first round will be today, uh, April 4th. Then we'll have April 5th, April 6th, April 7th, and on April 8th we'll have a rest day. Then three days of play, a rest day. Then three days of play, a rest day. Then two days of play, a rest day. Then two days of play and possible tie breaks on the on the 22nd. Oh no, okay. So 22nd is the uh, the tie breaks. 21st is the is the final day of the of the regular uh, chess. And uh, let's check out uh, some of the uh, regulations regarding the tournament so we're not gonna uh, talk about qualification you guys know of course how everyone qualified or the uh, format uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone knows it's an eight player double round robin uh, but yeah just in case you don't yeah it's an eight player double round robin uh, let me just uh, yeah okay maybe this will be better so an eight player double round robin uh, is the tournament the games are played using the electronic clocks and boards approved by FIDE uh, the time control for each game is 120 minutes for the first 40 moves, followed by 30 minutes for the rest of the game, with increment of 30 seconds per move starting from move 41. And this is uh, something that I enjoy much more than having the increment starting from move 1, because there's always time trouble, and then players are stressed, they make mistakes, we get more action, there's more blood, and, uh, well, the games are just uh, far more enjoyable than when you have increments starting from move 1. So I, I definitely... Uh, second this idea uh, also very important a player who arrives in the playing area after the actual start of his or her game uh, shall have 500 euros deducted from his or her prize uh, money a player who arrives in the playing area more than 15 minutes after the actual start of the game shall lose his or her game uh, by default but without financial penalty so it's a bit of a weird decision but uh, yeah uh, and uh, I don't think 120 minutes for the first 40 moves is the same for the open section and for the women's section. I think for the women's section, it's actually less. I think it's uh, 80 minutes, but uh, I, I will have to check. Uh, what about draw by mutual agreement? Can you just offer a draw on move one and, you know, just call it a day? 
Not really. The players cannot draw a game by agreement before the completion of Black's 40th move. So only after 40th move has been completed, you can offer a draw. A claim for a draw before the completion of Black's 40th move is permitted only in cases of draw by threefold repetition or if it's a stalemate. Uh, okay, conditions of victory. The final standings shall be determined by the number of points scored. Of course, that uh, makes sense. Uh, tie breaks, we're not going to go too deep into the tie breaks as there's quite a lot about all of the possibilities regarding the tie breaks, but I don't think we'll be seeing tie breaks in the candidates tournament. In the candidates tournament is that one special tournament when there's, where someone always plays the best tournament of their life and they just have, you know, at least half a point ahead of everyone else. If not, I will explain the, uh, the tie breaks in detail uh be before the start of the actual tie breaks uh so pairings and draw of color uh not really sure if you guys are interested in that uh for the prizes yeah we already mentioned that the open section has um, double the prizes of the of the women's candidates tournament uh, all the prize uh, money shall be divided equally among the players with the equal score after 14 rounds, regardless uh, tie breaks results. In addition, each player gets 3,500 uh, uh, 3, euros for every half a point scored. The prize money shall be paid by... Okay, we, we don't need to know that. This is the... Uh, the schedule for the games uh, for those of you who are in uh, in uh, Canada the games will be starting in 2 30 p.m but if you're Central European time like myself the games will be starting at 8 30 p.m uh, all right uh, travel and accommodation we're not really interested in that um, uh, all right this is all very very nice the organizer shall provide water coffee tea soft drinks free of charge for the players the principals VIPs and accredited media Playing conditions, and there you have uh, the anti-cheating uh, protection measures uh, for level one. Someone asked in the comments, so what are the anti-cheating measures uh, for the candidates tournament that you couldn't find any uh, info on this? So uh, there's quite a lot on this, but I've uh, took the liberty of uh, only uh, drawing up the important stuff here in my mighty notepad. So there you have it. So for level one events, and the level one events are ones where there's at least one hundred thousand dollars of, or I think it's maybe one thousand euros, uh, one hundred thousand euros of a prize fund, uh, and where players are uh, above twenty six hundred. That's where level those are considered level one events, and for them, uh, these are the anti cheating measures. You will have designated playing areas, so separate areas for players and spectators to prevent external influence. Uh, you will have security measures, at least two security measures from Annex A, which may include metal detectors detectors, additional anti-cheating arbiters, or closed-circuit cameras. Uh, you will have regular venue checks. The chief arbiter must regularly check the venue before, during, and after the games. Uh, game screening. All games must be sent in PGN formats for screening by the FIDE game screening tool. Uh, prohibited items. Metal containing items like watches and pens are not allowed in the playing area. So anything that could be used to construct a mechanical device, uh, you know, you, you can't have that. Uh, so secure storage facilities, organizers must provide secure storage for electronic devices. Identification of measures, organizers must identify the anti-cheating measures used uh, when registering the tournament with FIDE. And random checks. Uh, this is uh, the one I find weird. The chief arbiter must, advise, uh, must devise a system for random checks during the game. These measures aim to ensure fair play and prevent cheating in high stakes chess tournament. Now, while I'm all for, uh, you know, anti-cheating measures, I don't think it's a good idea to, for example, interrupt uh, uh, Pragnananda and Alireza, you know, in, in midst of battle in, in, a, in a critical position uh, if the arbiter, you know, uh, considers foul play, but I, I don't think that's what they actually meant by this. Uh, I think it's um, only to be used like if it's, if they're really really suspicious of a player. But I don't think someone actually spent their entire life studying chess to qualify for the candidates tournament to to try and cheat in the candidates tournament. I just don't see it happening. Like it'd be weird if it never happened. But uh, yeah, I, I'm just saying I I just don't see it. Uh, uh, happening so that's for the anti-cheating uh, measures uh, and um, except with the permission of chief arbiter only the players the principals and stewards shall be allowed in the playing area during a game uh, a player may communicate with an arbiter or a steward i think even uh, when they uh, have photographers or, or cameras for the players okay they have static uh, cameras and static photos but for for the actual cameraman to go into the into the tournament i don't think he's allowed uh, after maybe the first 15 minutes so during opening okay uh, it's you know the players are, are still in the opening phase there uh, unless you know nepo plays something really weird on on the second move 
Uh, but yeah, I think uh, he's allowed me. Maybe even less. Maybe even like I know for the uh, World Chess Championship match between Fabi and Magnus, the the uh, photographer was allowed in for maybe five or ten minutes, and then you know it's out, and no one no one gets in. So the players are not permitted to bring in the playing area a telephone, technical or other equipment extraneous to play, uh, which may in any way disturb or upset their opponent. The chief arbiter shall decide what constitutes uh, constitutes uh, extraneous equipment disturbing the opponent. Okay, so uh, while his or her game is in progress, a player may leave the playing venue only with the permission of chief arbiter and only if he she is accompanied by one of the arbiters. So... I'm guessing even if you go to the bathroom, you shall be accompanied by one of the arbiters. Uh, in case of this rule violation, the current game shall be declared lost by the player. So that is uh, that is very very strict. I mean, if if you have a, a small bladder, that could be uh, could be an issue. The anti-doping test uh, procedure shall be regulated by the FIDE Medical Commission according to WADA requirements. The organizer has to fulfill the requirements of the medical protocol as per standard of the FIDE Medical Commission. Uh, in the host country requirements. Okay, so score sheets, uh, uh, I don't think if there's uh, anything uh, really relevant, uh, but yeah, at the, end of the, at the end of each game, the player's original score sheets shall be submitted to the chief arbiter who shall hand them uh, to FIDE. Refusal of either player to sign the score sheets shall be penalized according to Article 12.9 of the Laws of Chess. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I never knew there was something actually called the laws of chess. After the players have signed the score sheets, the arbiter shall countersign those to confirm the results. So player player's conduct. Also, some of you asked this in the comments. Uh, what about the dress code? So the dress code is strictly observed for the tournament and all the official events um, and press conferences. So dress code for men is a neat shirt and a formal suit. Uh, and a dress code for women uh, is a neat shirt or blouse and a formal suit with uh, slacks or skirt or dress. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be very interesting how, how many rounds an Epo will last before wearing a, a Pokemon uh, t-shirt. So, no players with t-shirt, jeans, shorts, sneakers, baseball caps, or inappropriate dress uh, shall be allowed in the playing venue. Any uh, request to wear additional uh, national or traditional dress shall be approved by FIDE technical uh, delegate. So, the players are required to attend technical meetings called by the chief arbiter unless the chief arbiter permits otherwise. Okay, not, not very interesting. The players are required to be present at all official functions during the tournament, including the opening and closing ceremonies, as well as official receptions. The players are required to participate in a photo or a video shooting session to promote uh, the event if needed. Uh, its time and place shall be discussed with the players in advance. The players are expected to cooperate reasonably with the media. They are required to make themselves available for the daily press conferences and interviews with the press officer immediately after the game. So, yeah, the candidates tournament, although it seems like... Uh, players just have to play the game they also have to be involved in, in pretty much everything and it uh, i mean it definitely takes a toll on you after playing this tournament for for three weeks even though okay you have rest days so the uh the tournament's uh, winner is required to attend the final press conference uh, after the event and to provide the exclusive interview for official websites uh, if requested by the press officer <clears throat> and uh, the players uh shall strictly abide by all medical regulations approved by FIDE. Uh, the players shall be aware that regulations are subject to change. Okay, not very relevant. Uh, not very relevant. Not uh, Okay, if a player undermines the reputation of FIDE, uh, the candidates, tournament organizer and sponsors, other players, hosting country or city or conducts himself or herself in a matter contrary to the spirit of sportsmanship, he, she shall be penalized in accordance with the FIDE ethics and disciplinary code. So, okay, it definitely makes sense. The players are required to fulfill all obligations listed in their contracts. Uh, okay, principles of the uh, of the tournament, uh, the FIDE president, FIDE deputy uh, president, and the FIDE CEO, chief arbiter, and deputy chief arbiter, fair play officer, FIDE technical delegate, um, uh, press officer, representative of the FIDE medical commission, and the GCC uh, member if needed. Uh, then uh, how many arbiters? There are two uh, two uh, arbiters, the chief arbiter and the deputy chief arbiter. Uh, during the uh, during play, either the chief arbiter or his uh, or her deputy shall be present in the playing area. The chief arbiter may, in consultation with the GCC, uh, issue additional written regulation to inform the exact playing hours and take care of other technical details not covered by these regulations. Okay, not really important. Appeals committee. 
Uh, we're not going to go into that. Uh, ceremonies, uh, okay, the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it. Uh, these are the costs. Uh, I don't know if anyone's interested in that. But uh, yeah, these are the costs uh, of uh, of the of the total personnel. Uh, total tw 2,700, 3,300 3, euros. Uh, and yeah, don't think we are interested in anything else. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, that's a bit of, uh, okay, uh, uh, I'm sure you guys would agree that's a lot of information about the candidates tournament, but I only shared with you the most uh, important ones. And as I don't like to make a chess video without actually showing you a chess game, here I decided to show you a nice blitz game between Hikaru Nakamura and Fabiano Caruana from the Tal Memorial Blitz tournament uh, of uh, 2012. So let's enjoy that. But yeah, regarding the, the information about the tournament, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, very much looking forward to it. I, I don't know, what are your predictions? Uh, uh, I don't know, I don't remember if I've shown this. Yeah, these are the... Yeah, what what do you, what do you have for for round one? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm guessing uh, I'm most looking forward to Alireza versus Pragnananda, but uh, you know all of the games will be will be interesting. Fabiano versus uh, Hikaru definitely the the big match, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think um, Alireza and Pragnananda played uh, seven or eight games so far. Uh, I know in the FTX Crypto Cup, Fabiano Coruana, uh, no uh, Pragnananda defeated Alireza. It was a tough match, but over the course of four games, uh, Prague defeated him, and the other four games uh, outside of the the FTX Crypto Cup, uh, all all four ended in a draw. So it will be it will be a lot of fun. But yeah, let's uh, let's get into this game. So uh, Hikaru had the white pieces, and he opened with d4. We have knight to f6 and bishop to g5. Hikaru goes for the uh, Trompovsky attack, pawn to e6, and knight to d2. Uh, we have uh, pawn to h6, challenging the bishop, and the bishop to h4. Uh, pawn to c5, challenging the center, and pawn to e5, uh, e4, pawn to d5, pawn to e5, attacking the knight, and pawn to g5 now. Uh, so this is the classical defense uh, to the Trompovsky, uh, going after the bishop, and while you could capture, this is considered better for black, so bishop to g3, knight f to d7, and pawn to h4. Fabi advances the pawn to g4, and now d captures on c5, but before recapturing, uh, we have pawn to h5. And again, it has been played before, and interestingly, it's hard to say if Hikaru knew this at the time this game was played, especially because this is a blitz game, I mean, who prepares for a blitz game? Uh, Fabiano already defeated Nikita Vitugov uh, uh, in, in 2011, so a year prior to this game. But in that game, Vitugov played knight to, uh, in that game, Vitugov played uh, bishop to b5. But here we have knight to e2 by Hikaru, and it is now as of move 10 that we have a completely new game. So, okay, knight to c6, we have knight to f4. Uh, knight d captures an e5, and now knight to b3. So securing the c5 pawn, bishop to d7, and c3, gar uh, controlling the, here the knight, and also serving as a defense uh, against pawn to d4. Queen to f6, and now bishop to b5. We have pawn to a6, challenging the bishop, bishop to a4, and now bishop to h6, threatening to win the knight on f4. So knight to d3 captures with check, queen captures, and castles by both players. Castles, castles, uh, and bishop to f4 by Fabi. Offering to trade those dark square bishops, we have rook a to d1 and rook a to d8. Uh, queen to e2, uh, always makes sense to move the queen uh, away from the same file occupied by the rook, even though there's stuff in between that uh, that clears very easily. We have knight to e5, and now offering a trade of light square bishops, bishop captures, rook captures, and now knight to d4. Uh, knight to g6, uh, adding a defender to the bishop, also puts pressure on that h4 pawn by the queen and by the knight, and now pawn to c6. Okay, you have to react to this. B captures knight, captures, and now pawn to e5. Uh, rook to d6 was a little bit better, but uh, okay, pawn to e5. Sorry, this is a blitz game. Uh, knight back to b4, threatening the d5 pawn, and uh, Fabi defends it. Rook f to d8, and now just queen captures an a6, offering a queen trade. And while you could trade, uh, okay, Hikaru does have two connected pass pawns on the queen side. Uh, the engine says you definitely should do this, it's best, uh, but Fabi doesn't like it. He plays rook to d six and now queen to b5 uh tricking hikaru there's an even better move here i'm sure you guys see it uh it's knight captures on d5 and it's a really tricky move because uh well if you take the knight then the queen hangs if you take um 
uh, the queen, then uh, white, uh, the, the knight captures the queen with check, and once the rook recaptures, your rook takes the rook on d8 with check. So there's really nothing to do here. You can play queen e6, but now knight c7 with the same idea, and after queen to e7, you will just play rook captures on d6, let's say rook captures, and queen to c4 to defend your knight. You've snatched a pawn, and now you are just pushing to, to win the game. But it's blitz, uh, queen to b5 was played, now pawn to d4. We have captures, captures, and rook captures on d4, rook captures and now knight to d5, attacking the queen, queen to d6 now threatening to win the knight, and knight to c3. We have king to g7, and now uh, Hikaru starts pushing, pawn to a4. And uh, okay, it can still be played with rook to b4, it's still, it's still most likely a draw, but Fabi played pawn to e4, and now he falls victim to Hikaru's incredible tactics. Uh, feel free to pause the video and win the game for Hikaru while I give you a couple of seconds. So uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations on finding this tricky move. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, it is Bishop captures on f4. Other moves are winning as well. Knight to e2 is also winning. Queen to f5 is also winning. But Bishop captures on f4 just ends the game uh, basically on the spot. I mean, you you acquire the, the means necessary to win the game on the spot. Whether you will do it, that is up to you. But Fabi wasn't interested in sticking around to, to find out. So the problem is, uh, how do you recapture? If you capture with the queen you run into this nasty fork knight to e2 so you can't capture with the queen obviously you must capture with the knight and if knight captures on f4 which he played now look at this knight b5 it's not possible as queen occupies the b5 square but now queen to g5 with check frees up this, uh, the the b5 square for the fork but again you can block this can you block with with the queen nope uh, if you block with the queen then the knight hangs but if you block with the knight then your queen and rook remain here uh, in line for the fork so there's really no good move here knight g6 was played but he car sorry no uh king to f8 was played but it's the same idea Knight to b5, attacks the queen and the rook. Fabi played one last check, knight to e2 check, king to h1. And he was in this position on move 36 that Fabiano Caruana resigned the game. Uh, as there is nothing more to be done here. Uh, you could maybe try some queen to d8 uh, tricks. Uh, maybe if the white queen moves, you can take the pawn for checkmate as the knight covers g1. Or, or if, uh, you know, Hikaru trades, you can save your rook. But of course, Hikaru would just take the rook and... I mean, that's pretty much it. Queen captures on d4, now queen to b5, you push the pawn, you're up the exchange. Uh, nothing to, to worry about here. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And a little bit of extra info about the FIDE Candidates Tournament. I'm sure you guys are really excited for this one. I'm really excited for this one. And uh, I will try to at least publish one game per day, like I said, uh, as soon as the, the games finish, uh, like I always do. But, you know, if the games finish in like 3 a.m., I don't think I'll be able to do it. I, I do have, a, you know, a two-year-old daughter and she she's awake from like five. So, yeah, I don't see that happening. But I, I will do my best. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, that's the game. I uh, hope you guys uh, enjoyed it and a little bit of extra info about the candidates tournament. Uh, I would like to thank Andreas Rosenthal, Beaster Bunny, uh, Jeffrey Clayman, Lucas Teokaris, and David Gasparian for your contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. As usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching and I will see you soon. Continuing to check up on your wonderful suggestions, but mostly for the next three weeks covering the FIDE candidates tournament. Uh, so thank you all, I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day. And if I've missed anything important, uh, just ask in the comments, I will reply to you uh, in, in this video. See you soon.